we can now move one dimension from 2D to 3D and we're going to have a look at three major coordinate systems. One which should be very familiar to you which is Cartesian and then two coordinate systems which are polar that rely on extending the 2D polar to 3D in two different ways. Let's start with Cartesian. You probably already know that to get Cartesian system and 3D all you need is on top of the 2D Cartesian which form the base you add another axis which is the same that is Z and if you have a point here it is characterized by X Y Z equals to some A B C it's relatively straightforward. Now polar in 2D we saw that you could write as R theta and you could think that is sampling the same plane of X and Y if we were just looking at 2D the equivalent would be theta would be this and then this would be the polar axis where R is being processed and if R is negative it goes to the other side. For extending polar coordinates to 3D we have a choice. We can add something like for Cartesian another distance say you end up with R, theta and then some coordinate Z. These are called cylindrical coordinates and they look exactly like this. Essentially you start and just so we can compare it with Cartesian makes it easier. This is the plane that we would define polar 2D. If a point is for example say here in 3D you would first process theta so you get the projection. This would be R and then what you do is you look at Z. In the lecture notes you will find something that makes it even more obvious. Bottom line is that you're still processing things as in polar 2D with theta and R that give you a distance from the origin and then your Z coordinate tells you how high or low your point is in three dimensions. The other way that you can expand polar 2D to 3D, these are both 3D systems. There's a ukulele there, have you noticed it? Has it been here all along? Hmm. Get rid of it. The other way to expand polar 2D is instead of adding Z, we add another angle, say phi. In this case, we're looking at coordinates given by R, theta, and phi. It is important to understand, and as far as I can tell, looking in the literature, about 50% of the books and people will use a notation as I'll present in Physics 101, and about 50% of other people and books will use these angles to mean something slightly different. And it is important that you realize that this will be the case even for vector calculus 115. In Physics 101, the way that we're going to create this extension from 2D to 3D is to keep polar 2D coordinates exactly as they are and we're adding another angle. What does this mean? It means that if we look again into the Cartesian system and we look at this plane, if we had say a point like this, like you have in your lecture notes, the way that you process it, as you could say this is sort of the projection in the xy plane. You still count theta. If it's positive, it's this way. If it's negative, it would go the other way. You then process it in the same way as polar 2D. So in this plane, it would look like this. If R is positive, if R is negative, it would take it to the other side. And the difference now is that we are adding this angle which is called phi and in this case it'll be defined between the angle of the z apparently it was the y before the z axis and the line that connects it to the point the difference between the three 
3D coordinate systems is that here we're just reading off the values. Let's say that this is at x equals zero. In this case, we read off z, but we process an angle and then r being the distance from the origin. In this case, we're processing two angles and then we're multiplying by r. Or we're processing an angle, multiplying by r and then processing another angle. The great advantage of defining things in this way is that theta is always the azimuth angle and phi becomes the zenith angle, the angle between 90 degrees and whatever your point is. And this is exactly the same here, here, and also for 2D polar. It also means that we can very easily remember the coordinate transformations. If we define the spherical coordinates, and Cartesian coordinates in 3D in this way. It makes it very easy to remember coordinate transformations because theta is defined in the same way. Coordinate transformations where we want to go from spherical to Cartesian, which are also given in your lecture notes, are based on 2D polar and this implies that we get r cos theta and we just need a new projection, which will be sine phi, because of the way the angle is defined. For y, it will be very similar. We get r sine theta, as before, and then multiplied by sine phi. And finally, because of the way we're defining, z is very simply given by r cos of phi. These will be transformations between spherical coordinates and Cartesian coordinates with the way that we've defined the angles in physics 101. If we want to go, on the other hand, between Cartesian and spherical, we'll also find that they're based on the 2D polar and they are a very natural extension. You can write that r as plus or minus square root and now it's x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That is very obvious. That's what this distance really is. Theta, because it has been defined in the same way, is still arctan of y over x. And phi is given as the arctan of square root of x squared plus y squared over z. These are the coordinate transformations that you need when you want to go from Cartesian to spherical or polar 3D. And these are the coordinate transformations that you need if you're given something in terms of r, theta, phi into x, y, z. Remember, and this is a very important point, have a look at how the angles are defined. In some cases, as I've pointed out, people will define theta more like it was phi, and it can be confusing. So always read the question, but in Physics 101, this is how we define it. Any question in an exam or a worksheet will always be based on these definitions. And as I try to justify in the lecture notes, I think this is a much more elegant way to extend the systems, because then if you remove one dimension, you recover to the polar, and you're adding just another angle. You're not just reinventing the coordinate system. All we have to do now is try on a few examples. I would encourage you to try all of those that are included in the lecture notes. And I'll do just one transforming from spherical to Cartesian in the next and final video of section nine.